today on The Perspective with Mike Sherboneau and Julie Stoutland, a perspective favorite, Rachel Barbeau. Now, few wounds in life are as powerfully difficult as the parent wound. Mother wounds, father wounds, and few of us really like to talk about it. As a young girl, Rachel Barbeau faced a deep father wound, and what she says was rejection after learning that she was adopted. Attempting to numb her pain, she pushed every possible emotion as deep down as she could and used alcohol and cocaine to bury it all. Then enter sportscasting, a gift from God that let her see how much God loves her. But it wasn't until she gave her whole self to Jesus that she climbed out of drug addiction. The last time she took cocaine was when God spoke to her and she listened. Now Rachel helps others and gives back the gifts of Jesus every day in her organization, Changing the Narrative. Well, if you've been watching that intro, you know we're in for a great program today. But before we do that, Julie, how was your weekend? Because this is the beginning of the week for us as we yes. were taping. It was good. Celebrated uh, Father's Day, so that was always nice. How about you? Well, you know, my wife had a great idea to make a game. Okay. Yeah, that means I was making the game. <laughs> you know Jenga, the game you put yeah. the stuff. There's that commercial. Actually, it's for uh, potato chips, and they all <laughs> crash down. Well, I made the adult version, the outdoor version. Very sawdust nice. Sawdust everywhere. <laughs> but um, I discovered it was me making the game. And uh, anyways. Very nice of you. Yeah, we had a nice bonding time. <laughs> but Father's Day was great. As a yeah. pastor, it's one of my favorite days. Uh, we good. tracked together. We had a great uh, Sunday. Lots of fun things outdoors. People brought motorcycles, fancy cars. Ah. Some great big honking trucks. It was neat. <laughs> But I think people struggle with the whole thing of Father's Day. Absolutely. Some guys, I think, actually stay away because mm -hmm. I think they feel a bit of guilt and shame. And uh, here to help us unpack uh, mm -hmm. what it means to be actually fatherless is uh, uh, Rachel Barabow. I'm so excited she's with mm -hmm. us again today. She, mm -hmm. uh, she was saying she's almost feeling like family. Well, we're, <laughs> we're counting her that way. Yes. Not only national sportscaster, but especially right now with her whole movement, I am changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes on fantastic. and on and on, but we're going to welcome yes. Rachel right now. Rachel, thanks for being with us. So good to have you back. I feel so special and so honored. I'm like, let's keep doing this. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. Well, how about every uh, Tuesday, we'll just uh, sign it on and we'll carry it on from there. Oh. You know, Rachel, uh, I thought, you know when you think you know everything about somebody or at least most of the things, and then you did a recent interview where where you shared uh, a very painful part of your journey as a young woman, a little girl, and then to a young woman. I wonder if you could just take us back there and, and talk to us about what you're comfortable with mm -hmm. as you discovered that the dad you thought you had really wasn't your dad. Yeah, I just hosted this weekend, as a matter of fact, uh, at a fatherhood festival in Canton, Ohio. And I, I joked to the crowd, I said, you know, if, if um, my episode had a name, it would be my three dads. You know, I have a, a stepdad, I have an adopted father, I have a biological father. Now I even have like a bonus dad that's been around, there's almost like four. Um, so I have a very complicated father story, but I did not recognize that I was adopted by my father until I was 11 or 12. Wow. My parents had told me when I was younger, um, but I, I, I didn't care. I went back to watching the Smurfs, you know, I mean, I was just a, a happy little girl. And so I, I rediscovered this around 11 or 12, and it left a, a profound wound um, there. And what I did not tell people at the time and only realized and play back in retrospect was that is where the devil entered my life and started to call me um, names that I had never heard before, guys. Um, um, names like bastard and illegitimate and um, unwanted and unlovable. So were you reciting and, these in your mind? Did you find yourself doing that? Yeah, I did as a little girl. Oh, okay. No one in my family ever said it. None of my friends ever said it. I, you know, I had great little friends when I was a little girl. Um, and nobody ever said those things to me, but yet they were imprinted on my soul. And now what I know on my faith walk, that if I know that there's a loving and wonderful God that came to, to save us and sacrificed his son and he died on a cross, there is also an enemy and his name is Satan. Mm. And he comes to kill, steal and destroy. And so what he did from a very young age was imprinted those words on my soul. And guys, I never told anybody. So I, I internally wrestled with those names. And then I, those wounds became bigger and bigger and 
bigger. And I began to try to fill them with drugs and alcohol. So on that journey, talking about the fact of hearing those names in your head, you know, I, I, I know with my mom being adopted herself that what the impact is like to, to feel like you have this past you don't know about and, and wrestling with abandonment and that. How did you take those words and what were the steps that you started taking in your own life that were obviously not to your benefit? I, I started to use at, at 20, 21, I started to use um, cocaine. I started to use hard drugs. Um, I started to experiment with drugs earlier, but I started to use hard drugs, cocaine around that age. And at first it was just fun or so I thought, mm. um, but I blinked my eyes guys. And, and um, it was like eight years later and I was fully addicted. I was selling uh, cocaine to support my habit. I was hiding from other users, my poor mother and grandmother and, and my friends were about to have an intervention with me. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'd wake up and missing a, you know, a um, rear view mirror on my car. I was picking up cocaine in unsavory neighborhoods in the middle of the night just to support my habit. And, um, and the, the, the beautiful hard thing about that is that in all of that, God never stopped calling to me. Mm -hmm. He never mm -hmm. stopped saying, I love you, my child. I created you for more than this. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was, it was profound. So how, how did you feel that? How, how, when you look back now, because obviously looking back is 2020, how did you feel that sense of God was always there with you? I know you guys have talked about miracles and are going mm -hmm. to talk about miracles. And I consider this to be miraculous. I woke up one morning after staying up very late till three, four, five in the morning using, and then trying to take a downer to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I woke up one morning and I had a vision. I saw God in the corner of my room. Um, mm -hmm. And wow. you would think a, a lot of people have this, this idea of God, of Jesus, that is a, a mad, vengeful. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, those, it was not that at all. He it was this look on his face of sadness. And it was, I created you for more than this, my girl, come home to me. It was, I am the ultimate prodigal daughter. Mm. And um, so I just want to remind people that have messed up so badly, so profoundly, yeah. that he's not mad at you, that he has a robe mm. and a ring for you, that he loves you and he's calling you home. And this idea of this vengeful, wrathful God that is mad at you and, 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 you know, I, duh, 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 duh. that's not it. That's not it at all. Here I am in all my iniquity and all of my sin and all of my, you know, I say he took me from the guttermost to the uttermost. And here I am in that place. And he still has this beautiful look on his face saying, come home to me, my daughter. So was there a, a specific turning point? Because as I'm understanding this whole new part of your story, at least to me, this encounter with God, can you just tell us a little bit more about what happened? Mm -hmm. Like, it was like, because people that are addicted to drugs would say, it's so hard to quit. How right. do you change? And it sounds like you were set free very quickly. I, uh, I will say this. It was, it was over a period of time, probably six, eight months, I would say, where God just, the vision mm -hmm. that in my room, he also gave me a vision that I was a runaway train going down the wrong track. Mm -hmm. And I was going to either kill somebody else, kill myself, end up in jail, all of the above, break my family's heart. Um, and so he had been giving me these visions that he had been sharing what was going, what was going to happen with me. And then also at the same time, I was tired. I had given my life to Christ at 14 at a church camp. I was tired. I knew mm. that there was more than this. I knew I was doing wrong. I knew I was manipulative and, and lying and, and selfish and broken. And, and I was tired of living this life. And so um, God had been giving me these visions, as I mentioned, and I, I did it one last time or so. I uh, uh, that's, you know, I, I said, well, I'm just going to do this one last time. And as soon as as I did it, it went up my nose. I started to convulse and cry. And oh I heard the Lord say to me, your body is not your own anymore. And um, I had a friend that night at this party that normally I'd be up until, you know, daylight partying with them. But he saw how broken I was, how upset I was. And he ushered me into a, a, an empty bedroom with my dogs. My, my labs were there with me, sister labs. And so I slept and like at daybreak, people are still up in the other room partying at daybreak. I get up, I take a shower and I raced to church. I could not. <laughs> <laughs> to lay my head on that on that altar and say, God, I'm so I'm tired. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Please help me. 
And he supernaturally delivered oh, wow. me from Praise a God. eight year cocaine addiction. That yeah. is so beautiful. Rachel, yeah. um, man, <sighs> thank you. We've just yeah. seen a glimpse of your heart, mm -hmm. but we've seen a, a greater glimpse of God's love and just yeah. reaching out. And we're gonna be back with more. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna talk with you more, but I just feel compelled to say as you're watching right now, it's a good time right at this moment just to open up your heart and yes. say, Lord Jesus, I need you to come mm -hmm. into my heart right now and to be my savior and my Lord and my friend and my healer. He will hear that prayer just like he did for Rachel. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. I believe inside every one of us exists greatness. I believe inside every one of us exists limitless possibility. I want them to be able to look in the mirror and be proud of the person that's staring back at them. For some of you, you will walk out of here and you will never, ever, ever be the same. I'm the person that tells you you're not defective, you're not broken, you're not alone. It's for ages six to 96. All of us can be a king or queen. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. You are not too dirty. You're not too far gone. You're not too broken. I started to love myself. I set the boundaries. I set the template. I set the flow. I set the temperature for how everybody else treated me and how my life went. You know, Rachel, as uh, we just watched that little insert and then trying to process what you were going through, this uh, Carthuses of the heart, mm -hmm. as um, yeah. you just discovered God cleaning you up from the mm -hmm. inside out. How have you taken that message to young people and older people? I'd just love to hear that and let people know and talk to us about I'm changing the narrative. Yeah, you know, one of the most beautiful places I get to go to is a place I've been giving my testimony for 10 years, and it's called The Love Lady, and it is a Christian halfway house. I call it a whole way house because you get to bring your kids, you get an education, they give you Jesus. And so I've been going there for about twice a year for, for 10 years, giving my testimony. And early on, uh, about seven years ago, I had an agent who unknowingly attached shame to my story. And the agent mm. said, you know, you can't tell this part of your story anywhere except a place like this. So I, I he said, people won't hire you because of this. And so um, I didn't. And, you know, now I'm out. Now I'm talking about it. God dealt with me at the end of 2021. And he said, go to the least of these. Tell everybody, write about it. Talk about it. Don't be ashamed because there are so many people right now that are listening to this program that are that are shackled by shame and they're in the darkness and they, and the, the devil is keeping them away from the light, from truth, from setting them free. And that might be food. That might be alcohol. That might be porn. That might be drugs. That might be money. Mm -hmm. That might be anything. It doesn't have to be necessarily drugs. And so exactly. for me, here's the crazy part. <laughs> when I hold a woman in my arms who is wrestling with addiction, who's coming out of uh, prostitution, drugs, jail has been beaten, has been sold. In those moments, I say, thank God for what happened to me, because if not, I would not be able to hold them and say, I've been there too. I am, you know, we may not have exact same circumstances, but I've wrestled with addiction. I know what, what your story is. And so in those moments, I am thankful because if I walked in there and said, oh, I've got it all together. This, you know, how would you relate to me? People don't exactly. relate to your perfection. They relate to your brokenness and your imperfection. They do. I love that about you, Rachel. And you know my own story about eating disorders and sexual abuse and how I felt like such damaged goods and the whole issue of shame and coming out and sh being willing to share that is so powerful. And it's amazing how you have broken through that barrier because we see it in our culture. We see the messages of shame. We see how, uh, you know, this ancient human emotion, how, how, how it's so difficult to overcome. I want to know what are some of the things that you share in I'm Changing the Narrative to help people get rid of this shame? And, you know, as you answer that question, you want to fill in a little blank for me, Rachel. <laughs> like that agent. Like, did you fire him? <laughs> because that was he's shame gone. being put on you. Right. Um, yeah, he, he's and, gone. And I, and I get that. I get why people say that, oh, you're not going to be as marketable if, if you tell this part of the story. But I just look at what Jesus has done in all of us. Yeah. And 
Yeah, so take us back to this whole thing like Julie was talking about, about shame and, yeah. and guilt. And how do you speak that into people's lives? Yeah. Because uh, while it happens instantaneously, walking in the freedom is something else. Yes. Yeah. Two things. One, I did fire the agent. Um, he was also <laughs> an agent that told me that I needed to um, tame down my faith. I needed to stop talking about Jesus because, quote unquote, my dogma was going to keep me from getting hired. Oh. And I said to him, I said, in no uncertain terms, I was very professional about it. But I said, if my faith keeps me from getting hired, I did not want that job anyway. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and and my God shall provide all my needs. My God shall put my resume from the top to the bottom. He shall open doors that I can't open. So yes, he is long gone. Bless him. Praying for him on the way out. But to to uh, to your answer, I'll say this: I practice something that every single person that is listening to the sound of my voice can practice today. It is called radical vulnerability, and mm. you just did it by saying. I went through eating disorders. I went through this. What it does is it gives other people permission to drop their mask, to drop their guard and say, oh, you went through that too? Wow. Well, I went through this. It gives other people the comfort and the space and the permission to share what they've gone through. And let me tell you the way I just just spoke on this, the way we take back this plague on our land of mental health, of bad mm -hmm. mental health, of dis-ease, of suicide, is by telling the truth and shining light. Mm -hmm. Because what's happening right now is we get isolated, and in the isolation is where the devil whispers, you are worthless, you are sick, you are broken, don't tell them, no one will love you, you'll lose this, you'll lose that. But when we breathe light and give truth the freedom to be truth, um, that is where we take, I believe, this plague back from the enemy. You know, as you share your story, would you explain something? Because I think it'll help set our viewers free, at least some of them. <clears throat> and, and what it is is this. Um, hmm. You had a battle going on. You knew that God loved you, that he was calling you. Um, and yet you were still doing drugs. You were still partying. You still felt him calling you back. How did you wrestle with those two? And, mm -hmm. and why do you think you said no to the call of God for such a long time? I was broken. I was so broken. And I was trying to fill the holes that I had in my heart with uh, the things of this world that are never going to fill. Listen to me, whoever's in the sound of my voice, no money, no purse, no car, no job, no man, no woman, no thing, no accomplishment, no award will ever fill the holes of your heart. The I'm talking about the holes that are blasted wide open in your soul that you've never even told anybody about. The wounds, the father wounds, the mother wounds, the, the um, abuse wounds that you've never shared. With no thing in the world, no substance will ever fill them or numb them. The, the person and the thing that can fill them and make them whole and new and make you new is Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the reality uh, of this situation. And so I, I believe the lie of the enemy for a really long time. Um, I was the prodigal daughter. I was, you know, about in the world in a pigsty trying to do it my own way. And then I looked around and thought, what am I doing here? What am I doing with my life? Yeah. You know, and it's stories like yours, Rachel, that, that that's why we share them. That's why we share them. Yeah. So if there's someone else there that's out there right now, and is fighting through that fear, fighting through that shame, going, I can't do it. And like, no, you can. Other people have. Rachel's done it. I've done it. Mike's done it. You can do it. And it, that's why we have these messages shared for people to hear. It's possible. We're walking with you right now. Yeah. If you choose to give God a chance and go to him with all your fear, with all the damage and all the, the stuff that's happening in your life, surrendering it to him, he will meet you and he will change you and he will bring everything to light. You don't have to walk in this cloud any longer. He's there for you. If you just hey, reach Julie. out. Julie, just to back up what you're saying to somebody right now who is bitter, who's hurt, who's, um, who's any of those things, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would say just what you said, try Jesus. Yep. If you've tried everything else. Exactly. 
and it hasn't worked. Try Jesus. Because I promise you, he loves you. And I tell people this all the time. He's right there waiting to enter your story, but he has to be wanted. He gave us the gift of free will. He has to be invited in. And if you've tried everything else and it hasn't worked, try Jesus. Amen. You know, Rachel, um, (sighs) I just appreciate your appeal. Let's go on the road and preach the gospel (laughs) together. That's kind of dead when I hear that. I'm just saying, let's go. Um, And we're doing it here you've got this movement called I'm Changing the Narrative, and you've got a couple big initiatives coming up that maybe some of our viewers watching today are able in a significant way to get behind you because they are large initiatives. Tell us about them. Yeah, absolutely. We are hosting three in the past. We've done one a season, so this fall football season. Um, we've done one a season in the in, in the in the past, but this season, my organization, I'm changing the narrative, is hosting three um, mm-hmm. mental health games, three collegiate um, football mental health games. And people ask me all the time, what do you want out of these games? I want one person in the stadium or one person watching or one person on social media to hear the messaging and feel less alone, less defective, less like taking their own life, less isolated, wanting to get help, understanding being radically vulnerable is the way to go and that people do care about you and that people would rather share your burdens than carry your casket. Yes. So, yes. yes. Woo. There you go. <laughs> that, is, that is a big one. And so yes. um, I, I know that you share my my website, but it's I'm changing the narrative.org. I'm changing the narrative.org. And they can send uh, me an email. We can set them up with a tax deductible donation. You can become a sponsor. You can get involved in any way. You can serve. You can be anonymous. You can be out there. But the more people that um, help us uh, provisionally and the more that heaven helps us provisionally, the more people that we can touch um, and help and snap. I say this all the time. The more people we can snatch back from the enemy. And let me just remind uh, people very quickly (laughs) that when you give it to God and when you do it God's way, you are going to become enemy number one of Satan. You are going to, he is going to try to kill, steal, and destroy you. See, I didn't have to ruin my own. I didn't have, Satan didn't have to ruin my life when I was on drugs. I was doing it myself. Now he, he hated me then, but he really hates me now because I'm (laughs) working out what, what God has meant for me. So he attacks me in places in my marriage, in my business, in my friendships, in my own life. So I will just remind people that once you come to Christ, you also become enemy number one of, of Satan. And so get ready for that and put on your armor and your breastplate and your belt and your shoes um, because God has a beautiful plan for your life and it's the greatest adventure. Yes. Well, Rachel, our time is gone. So let's just make it a standing Tuesday appointment, okay? <laughs> I love it. I and love we're going to hang up. We've got we to close we right now. Close. I think we've got about, I don't even know if we have time, but I want to pray for you. Lord, I want to commit Rachel mm-hmm. to you and the ministry that you've given to her. We praise you for the transformation in her life. Mm-hmm. And we're thankful that you are the God who still performs miracles. Yes. And may each viewer watching today draw hope mm. and strength and experience you in all your miraculous power. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We talk about being a king, not on the football field, a king with your word, with your time, with your effort, with your character. There's nothing greater than calling somebody a king or queen and and helping them find their purpose and watching their soul rise up to it. She changed the life of our players about mental health awareness, how to treat women like queens, not like how our society says through music, but queen. Well, that was just uh, simply a powerful experience as Rachel unpacked her story. I don't know what your story is today. Maybe you're hiding behind that wall of shame and you just wish that you could get it out, get it off your chest so that you could walk in freedom. Could that be you? Or maybe God's been calling and whispering your name for longer than you can even remember. Maybe it's been two years or three years. You made a bad decision a decade ago, and you still haven't turned back. God has been speaking. He's still reaching out to you. And you're thinking, I need a miracle. But can a miracle really happen? We come again today to the book of Mark, and as we're journeying through, we come to chapter 6. And there's two stories that we find here, both that just connect so much with my heart. Uh, They're miracles because... 
there was divine intervention. God showed up in ways that nobody could ever imagine. And that's the word of hope for each of you today. God wants to show up in your life, and he has the power, and he is able to do the miraculous in your life, to bring you new hope, new life, new strength, and a fresh perspective for where you're at today. You might be 15 or 25 watching this show, or you could be 75 or 95. It doesn't really matter your age, but you need to know that God wants to meet you right where you're at. I think of the example in Mark 6, and the first story is when Jesus has been teaching the 5,000 men plus all the women and children, and uh, they're hungry. And he says to his disciples, give them something to eat. He said, well, how are we going to do that? There's no McDonald's. There's no Taco Bell. There's uh, no Wendy's. There's no drive through that we can go to. And uh, he says, you give them something to eat. And then, of course, there's the young boy that comes along with the, the fish, the two fish and the five loaves. And Jesus blesses it, and he multiplies it. And a miracle happens. And the disciples are astounded. I'm wondering in your life if you've seen a miracle, if you've seen God radically touch someone's life. Maybe it's even been your own life. And yet you've choose to ignore that. You've forgotten the call of God, how he showed up in a very specific time in your life. Well, you're not alone. Because later on in the evening, the disciples go to cross the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And as they cross the Sea of Galilee, Jesus doesn't go with them. They've seen this incredible miracle, and they're rowing, and they get into a storm. But Jesus is aware of the mess that they're in. It's like a continuation, much like Rachel's story. And what happens here is that they're, they're concerned. Are they going to sink? What's going to happen? Will they perish? Their mind is going miles and minutes. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Another miracle. But what happens? They see his form. They think he's a ghost. And they're terrified. They're overwhelmed with fear. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to fill you with fear. He wants to fill you with the sense that there is no hope, that things can't change, that you can't turn the scenario around. But we come, and in Mark chapter 6, they cried out, and, but immediately he spoke to them, and he said, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. What an interesting commentary. When it talks about our hearts being hardened, it means that we've seen everything. We've seen the power of God at work, and yet we've put our hands up and said, thanks, God, but no thanks. And once again, Jesus showed up as the great I am, the one who's able to intervene. And he's saying, will you trust me? Will you believe me? Will you follow me? And today he extends that invitation to you. He invites you today to walk with him. Would you write to me today? at the perspective, and uh, when you write to me, I'll be happy to send you some literature to help you in your faith journey and to help you stay on track as you walk with God and experience his miracle today in your life.